So thanks for coming. Thank to you. This interview. Um, I think we'll start with a general question, which is, where do you find inspiration for your structures? Well, I, I should start by saying that most of the time when I work on a project, there is a large team, notably including an architect, but also clients and other people. And inevitably, the initial ideas that come up, wherever they come from, get modified quite a bit through that collaborative process. And I find the most exciting times when something emerges from that discussion that's unexpected. So I may come to the table with something or my colleagues may come to the table with something. And in the best of circumstances, we come away with something completely different. Um, that said, I think geometry is important for me. And oftentimes, I try to organize thoughts and ideas around geometric principles, partly because it clarifies and gives proportion to things, but also because it's often a way in which to communicate about form that, you know, is the geometry simple? Is it complex? Does it involve a lot of advanced modeling and, and so on? Um, so I think those are the two collaboration and geometry. Um, what are some of the challenges that you have encountered with your designs and what is the most challenging project you've worked on? It's hard to say the most. Uh, the, the, you know, partly because I forget. So probably the most challenging is the one that I've blocked out. <laughs> uh, but also because they're all so different. I, I think the challenges come often in the challenge that exists in trying to get something done that's a little different from the usual. And so probably the common thread in all the work that, that I've been involved in um, is that we try to do something different, use a different material, use a different methodology for construction or, or you know, so for example, we did a dormitory at MIT a couple of years ago and um, we proposed building the perimeter of that out of precast concrete, a kind of Lego set and getting everyone to um, understand what we were talking about and then accept that it was actually economical to do that under the circumstances was a big challenge. And then inevitably when we got to the end of the project, it turned out to be so easy to make that bid out of precast that the contractor was unhappy that we hadn't made everything out of precast. Um, other times, you know, you'll find yourself, we had a project in Toledo, a museum, glass museum that we worked on with uh, Japanese architect Sana. And there, the, the, the challenge was to make a very, very thin roof. And we got into trouble with the fabrication of the roof, not including the camber and other aspects that, that, that had been specified. So we had to go back in with some specialists and, and actually heat the steel to push it back into shape. And there was a five-month period there where there was a lot of contention back and forth between different parties. There was a big challenge to figure out how to fix the problem. But in the end, it worked out, and not everybody was happy, but the final result was what we had intended. So I think that's, it's sort of an adventure. You, know, you never quite know where you're going to end up, and it, probably I try to make each project as much of an adventure as possible by setting it up in a way that, that creates those sort of challenges. So on to more enjoyable structures. Um, which of your structures did you most enjoy designing or find most interesting to design and why? Again, the problem of which is the most interesting to design. Um, it's hard to say. I think at one level, it has to do with scale. So, you know, at, 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 at the small scale, we did this um, canopy a number of years ago that's still there at the U.S. Air Terminal in LaGuardia, which is glass and carbon fiber. And it was the first time, I think, that anyone used carbon fiber reinforced epoxies for something in a building that was structural. I mean, it was not really primary structure, but it was still had to hold itself up. 
And so we got into this whole adventure with the Port Authority proving that it was safe to use this epoxy and going through a whole battery of tests. In the end, the thing is this combination of glass used structurally, cables, and this composite um, leaf that provides shade, really, for the ticket counters. And it's so precarious and and small in, in its elements that I'm hoping that nobody dares take it apart because they don't know how it, to do that. So I, I like that for its durability on that basis. The other project at the other extreme, I think, was the working for six months on the World Trade Center Tower 1, which was known at the time as the Freedom Tower, where there was this extraordinarily intense political situation, both broadly, you know, in terms of the politics behind you know, calling it the Freedom Tower, um, and the politics within the design team and within the relationship between the design team and the client and the site and everything. And what I found interesting was the challenge to try to advance a rational response to the problem, which was to build a tower that was mostly broadcast tower on top of a building in a way that was elegant and simple, but also gave a certain energy to the form that would uh, fulfill the expectations that people had. And we got quite a ways down. There's actually an exhibition that's opening a couple weeks of some of the models that we did for that show, for that project. But in the end, as you know, it was sort of diverted into a different design. And actually what they've done now is, I think, quite simple and straightforward. But coming to terms with the relationship between the engineering challenges, the design challenges, the, the emotional challenges, and um, the very difficult circumstances of the project setup was, in retrospect, I think one of the more ex interesting experiences I've ever had. Um, as you talk about a lot about trying to do new things, what new innovations are you currently seeing in the building design field? I think I, I'm never quite sure whether there are significant new breakthrough innovations. I mean, we, you know, if you read through the history of, of architecture and structures, there are often these so-called revolutionary moments where concrete arrives or, or Maillard um, invents dex different arches or, and, and uh, so on. I, I have a view of history that is more evolutionary in that many times ideas that are uh, presented now as revolutionary uh, are in fact similar to certain ideas that occurred in the more distant past but transformed in some, in some way. So often I find it interesting to look back at the history. I mean, for example, um, there are often comparisons made between the work of Frank Gehry and the Statue of Liberty because of the relationship between this fluid form of the, of the skin and the, and the structure within it, which is separate from the skin. And that relationship between structure and skin, where they're not one thing, is an interesting one. But many times people say that it, it, it's impossible to do what Frank Gehry does without computers. But in fact, the Statue of Liberty was done long before there were computers. And so I think what is interesting about innovation is usually more complex then a new technology comes along and everything changes. That said, I think that probably the most interesting thing right now is the increasing interest and concern with the carbon footprint of materials and products. And uh, you know, in a way, the translation of the slow food uh, movement into structural engineering. And so I like to think about slow concrete you know, and slow steel, and and I'm seeing others that, that are starting to think in those terms, and for me, that's an interesting avenue today. Um, so back sort of to this idea of the Freedom Tower and the World Trade Center site, um, do you think that tall building design has changed since 9-11? Well, the, the, the exhibition that, that I was involved in at the Museum of Modern Art in 
2003, 2004 on tall buildings was in a way prompted by the concern that that there would be an effect on tall buildings because of 9-11. Uh, more in the sense of discouraging people from building tall buildings. In fact, I think what's happened, and I don't know how much 9-11 had to do with this and how much just the economic boom or bubble of that period of time, but the kind of exuberance of tall building design, particularly in Asia and the Middle East, seems to have somehow been sparked by 9-11, and it's almost as if there was this overreaction to excesses of form in response. I'm not sure what to make of it. it I think it, there's a certain psychological dimension, probably. Um, hopefully that's going to calm down, because I think in a lot of cases it created very unattractive and expensive forms. Um, so, ironically, rather than discouraging uh, the construction of tall buildings in a funny way, it encouraged a proliferation of strange forms and and sometimes a certain absence of rationality and um, and and frugality, which I think maybe now is returning. In your writing, you stress the symbolic power of tall buildings. Are there any tall buildings that you feel are particularly powerful and why? Well, I think I still think that the that many of the most interesting tall buildings are the ones that have been designed by Norman Foster um, with a variety of different um, engineers and also Renzo Piano because in both cases there is a great interest in the social um, construct of a tall building and so um, particularly Foster with the Hong Kong, Shang Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank but also with his building in, in Frankfurt and and maybe culminating with the Swiss Re building, the, 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 the round building in, in London, was very concerned about creating interrelationships between floors, creating common spaces that were green, allowing for natural ventilation. Um, I'm not sure that the buildings are always successful, but the intention, the social intention, is very, um, it's a very good and strong one. And I'm sorry that that doesn't get picked up by many more architects, particularly in America. Uh, Piano, I think, with his New York Times building, the tower that he's doing right now in London as well, has tried to create common spaces and, and a sense of, you know, as the way that Foster started r talking about it with the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, of breaking a building down into villages so that, that the way you move to your space is that you move not to your floor and your cubicle, but to your group of floors that somehow has a sense of, of, of collective. Um, that, I think, is, is, um, is a strong, strong approach. Um, in one of your writings, you mentioned that n in New York, architects and engineers um, don't, they work separately. How would you encourage them to collaborate? How do you encourage them to collaborate? Well, personally, I've tried to do that um, through competition. Um, I, you know, I started the New York office of Arab in 1987, and I think one of the consequences of Arab coming into New York, and they were they were nervous about doing it because of their perception that there was a lot of very strong competition. Les Robertson, for example, um, loomed large as a as a competitor, my former employer, Paul Weidlinger, and others. So they felt as if it was a very strong community of engineers who wouldn't welcome a new kid on the block, so to speak. And in truth, I think what happened was that because Arab came and was successful, um, it prompted a lot of other engineers to come from Europe. And so a certain uh, approach to engineering, you know, at Arab, at Bureau Happold, uh, with Werner Sobeck, with now Jörg Schleich, and many others who have come, um, has challenged the community to, to step up and, and respond to, to architects with the same kind of energy and, and, uh, and, um, and collaboration. So that's one thing. The other thing that, that we did in the early 90s was start the Structural Engineer Association of New York, which was also an attempt to create a sense of, of of 
collegiality but also competition. Um, so I think, I think that the examples of others from around the world um, is a good way to get engineers to to want to work that way and architects to desire that kind of collaboration. It still depends on the chemistry between people, on the interests that architects have to have those kinds of, of relationships, on the interests that clients have for those to, to happen. But I'd say that there are many, very good um, engineers now working in New York who who want to work that way, who sees the opportunities that are available to them, and architects who are curious to find those kinds of partnerships. Well, building off of that, how do New York engineers differ from engineers in other cities such as Chicago? Well, I think that the difference between New York engineers and Chicago engineers is, is, an, evolution, is an evolving difference. I think historically there's always been a commitment in Chicago to architecture. You know, the, the, the current mayor who's retiring, uh, Richard Daly, is unique, I think, perhaps as a mayor who has been extremely supportive of good architecture to, to you know, and you see the evidence. Um, so there's a sense of almost civic pride about the relationship between engineering and architecture that is sort of hardwired into the DNA of, of, um, of Chicago. Um, there are a number, notably, of course, Bill Baker um, of, of, of contemporary engineers who manifest that. And uh, so I think that tradition continues. I think in New York, it's gone in cycles that, that uh, there was a, um, you know, if you go back historically to the beginning of tall buildings, um, Gunwald Aus, who was the engineer for the Woolworth, Woolworth Tower, it's not very well known. You know, Homer Balcom, who was the engineer for the RCA building and the, and the Empire State Building, among others, is not that well known. Um, and if you study their work, uh, Weisskopf and Pickworth later on, and then on to Weidlinger and Severed, and then Robertson, and so on. If you study their work, oftentimes it is very pragmatic and m almost always divorced from, from the architecture. So Woolworth Building, Empire State Building, RCA Building, Daily News Building, West Cobb and Pickworth are functional structures, but they don't really advance um, the art in a way that Kahn did or that, that um, others did in Chicago. Um, now I think it's changed, and I think that's partly the result of the fact that New York has become much more of an international center for design. And so the engineers that are practicing in New York are many European imports, but also the Americans that practice there practice all around the world, and often in collaboration with other engineers around the world. And so their, their approach has evolved. And so I don't, I don't think the current New York kind of practice is the same as what it was in the 40s and, and, and earlier, and what it was also, I, I'd say, in the 70s and 80s when postmodernism was, was dominant and engineering was not. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, the cyclical aspect is if you look at the work of someone like Weidlinger, um, he was particularly successful and, and prominent in the 60s when there were architects like Breuer and Bunshaft who wanted to collaborate with him. And if you look at the Beinecke Library at Yale, for example. It's a very sophisticated piece of collaboration. But it happened because Bunshaft was inclined to that, Gordon Bunshaft. Um, Breuer was inclined to manipulate precast concrete in interesting ways. You then have this real um, uh, uh, what drought that started in the mid-70s. It pretty much was in place when I moved to New York in the early 80s, where the architectural community that emerged in the late 60s, New York Five and others, was simply disinterested. Uh, you know, Venturi, Graves, Meyer had no interest in, in structures. And their interest didn't really start to emerge until a little bit later because of the example of people like Piano and, and Rogers and Foster. But because of that disinterest, you really had no opportunity and in 
invitation for engineers to do things that were innovative. And so you really again you have this gap from sort of mid seventy to late eighties. And then I think it's picked up again as I as I tried to describe. Um so you talked about Fosler Khan sort of advancing the field of of buildings, I suppose. Um by having this collaboration between engineer and architect, do you think that there needs to be that collaboration in order to advance the field of engineering and architecture? I think, and I think I've tried to articulate this in, 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 in writing sometimes, that there really are a variety of different forms of practice for engineering, that you have what Billington calls the, the structural artist, uh, someone like Maillard or Men, who is really an independent. Um, I'd say that your concert today um, is an example of that, the Swiss engineer. And they, they develop independent practices doing independent work that is uniquely theirs. And their influences are within the, within the realm of engineering. You know, so you can see Schleich's influence on men or men's influence on Schleich, but it, it, it happens within, within the discipline, within that community. They tend to resist influences from architecture in a way. Um, I think at the other extreme, you have technicians who simply enjoy the problem solving of fitting a structure inside. You know, Homer Balcom, for example, is a very capable technician. Fred Severed was very creative, but creative in a way that, that solved a problem, um, but didn't really affect the uh, expression of, of the architecture in most cases. You know, the, the TWA terminal or even the St. Louis Arch is, is, is solved in a sophisticated way, but not, um, uh, not a way that, that transformed the thing itself. In between, I think you have a variety of, of collaborators. And personally, I put Khan in that category, um, who, who feed off the kinds of interactions that I was trying to describe. That, you know, I think Robertson is, is, is that way. I think LeMessure was that way. Um, Weidlinger working with Bunshaft. And their work, uh, Peter Rice, in, in the UK, um, their their work is is really inseparable from the relationships that that they had, that made that work um, not only possible but but that fed the creative energy behind the work. So, you can look at Peter Rice, for example, in his relationship with with Richard Rogers or or Renzo Piano or others, and see threads of his own interests. Uh, tied arches that he learned from the Russian engineer Shukov um, about how to make an arch like a bicycle wheel. Um, and he applies it in these different projects with different people. So he had a certain line of research that he was interested in and, and explored it, but explored it in conjunction with, with other interests and preoccupations of the in architects that he was working with. Um, Robertson is the same. I mean, Robertson has this extraordinary interest in in manipulating different types of steel to 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 distribute stresses, and we did this diagram for you know the World Trade Center towers that he did, which showed the color of the different fourteen different types of steel, and it's this extraordinary creativity that's invisible. So it's it's there, but it's there in a kind of parallel existence to the architecture. I think it influences the architecture, and I don't think buildings that he's worked on would have happened the way they did without him. But it's not independent the way that man is independent. I'd say the same about Khan. I mean, I don't think Khan would have, um, I don't think the, the body of work that Khan did would have existed without Myron Goldsmith and the, and the intensity of their relationship and collaboration, or for that matter, without Bruce Graham. And so I think it's inseparable in that way. You know, I, I, I don't know from a, from a scholarly point of view who came up with the, the massing of the Sears Tower? To me, it has a kind of nobility that reminds me of, of, of some of Audin's sculpture. It sort of leans back and stands proud in a way that is figural. 
did that come from Khan? Did that come from from um, Graham? I don't really know, but I, I I think it's a question because it's impossible to to establish from the body of work that you look at that there is a defined thread that is Khan separated from those other people the way again there is for Maya or or men. So I think for me I I. I I understand it by thinking in terms of those who are like men um, operating as as structural artists, um, which is different, by the way, from someone like Kalatrava, who is operating more as a sculptor, um, than those who are in the camp of Robertson, Rice, and so on, and then those that are very creative, but in a way that doesn't impact form. Um, our class largely focuses on Fazla Khan, and we were wondering how Khan has specifically influenced your work, and what other engineers strongly influence you. You've mentioned several names, and which ones are the most influential? Khan, I think what, what I, I mean what I was trying to describe about about the Sears Tower, the, the the figural quality of the Sears Tower was very important to me when I was working on the Freedom Tower, World Trade Center One Tower, and, and I often explained that that relationship um, in in that um, in the discussions that we were having, uh, that that it was possible to have a form that had a integrity about it from a structural point of view and yet have a certain figural quality that, that would transcend or, or augment that, that, that um, aspect. I think the other thing about Khan that, that and, and that, that's quite manifest, I think, in, 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 in Bill Baker um, and his practice, is the, the kind of interest and, and preoccupation with the mathematics. And, you know, when I said earlier about geometry, I think that that Kahn was rigorous about thinking through the mathematical context of of what he was doing, all his writings about frame wall interactions and and he he gave form to the sophistication of of those mathematical approaches in a way that was very creative. And I like that, that that there is there is a relationship between math, mathematics and form that is embodied in, in, in their work. Um, for me, I'd say the the influences. Um, well, Les Robertson is a big influence because of the, the 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 modesty and enthusiasm of his of his work. The fact that 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 there is a, a desire to craft something for its own sake without necessarily needing for it to find um, immediate expression. I. I, I I respect craft, and I respect that some things can be done very well and remain invisible. Um, Peter Rice is is, is um, also someone that I admired for again his modesty in in listening to architects and and being able to to enhance their work in very significant ways and their thinking and enjoy that. Um, that contribution. I, I think that, that to the degree that, that engineers can participate in the construction of a culture that, that cares about craftsmanship and ideas um, regardless of their necessary expression, um, then I think you can find a, a common ground between a Fred Severed, a Christian man, a Peter Rice, because they really all, at root, are committed to that same um, ideal. Um, in your piece, Tall Building as Metaphor, you discuss the difference between dialectical and monolithic structures. And we sort of talked about this with classifying structures. Um, but how exactly would you classify Fosler Khan's buildings and what specific characteristics would put them into those categories? I was, um, well, the monolithic was actually 
in my mind at the time, associated with the Monadnock building, which is one of my favorite buildings in, in Chicago. You know, it's a tall masonry and related in form to the Brunswick building that, that Kahn worked on with Ryan Goldsmith. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that, that Kahn belongs to that tradition and, and the desire for the, the architecture and the structure to, to, to be unified in one form. Uh, the um, you know, Sears Tower, Hancock Tower, and so on. So that, that would be what I, what I would mean by monolithic. Um, may not be the best term, but it's that sense of, 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 of unification there. The dialectical notion is really where the notion of metaphor comes from, which is that you can have different um, parallel um, systems in a, in a building which in their own integrity refer to their discipline, refer to the innovations that they, they engage, but are not necessarily married tightly to, to the form. And the Statue of Liberty is a great example of that because Eiffel's structure was very innovative and very um, appropriate and creates a space inside that, that structure that's quite marvelous, but it has nothing to do with the statue form. And I think that Schleich's collaboration with Frank Gehry, you know, on the building they did together in Berlin, Pariser Platz, um, bank building, there's a very complex fluid form roof which uses the grid shell system that Schleich has developed. And there, the two working together sort of pushed and pulled until they got something that, for me, has a great deal of energy um, from that 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 um, uh, synthesis as well as as tension. Um, what advice would you give to undergraduate seniors in civil engineering who have ambitions toward tall building design? That's a good question. Why? How would you? In other words, how do you get from A to yes. T? Okay. <laughs> I um, I have found that that opportunity opportunities uh, accrue to um, often to people who have a very particular skill that they can leverage to um, to 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 get broader responsibility. So. You know, if, if you become quite knowledgeable in wind engineering and you know more about wind engineering than anybody else, and you understand the dynamics of wind engineer, or you, you develop an ability to know exactly, as Bill Baker would say, how to confuse the wind, um, then you become a necessary and essential member of the team. And then from that capability, you can you know, expand your, 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 your opportunities. So I would say that the the way to, um, it's about how you get on the teams that do the tall buildings and then, and then emerge from there. And probably um, working for a while, going back to graduate school and becoming very um, adept at something that really interests you. Um, you know, air elastic problems, uh, mass tune dampers, you know, active control, you know, something that that, that you identify as a key part of, of, of tall buildings. Um, that's one way. I think the other way is, is actually to go work for an architect for a little bit and, and work for an engineer for a while and try to understand better how those cultures um, think and communicate and get good at, at um, being part of that communication. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for your questions.